Hi everybody, today we're going to be reviewing the second ch half, half of chapter 23 about the Gilded Age from 1869 to 1896. And we're going to be discussing the presidencies of Garfield and Arthur. So in the presidential campaign of 1880, Hayes was a man without a party and James Garfield was from an electorally powerful state of Ohio. The vice presidential running mate was a notorious stalwart henchman, Chester Arthur of New York. The Democratic candidate was a Civil War hero, Winfield Scott Hancock. This is about civil service employment, and we'll discuss this later in the video. The statistics from the election. Garfield polled more votes than Hancock. The margin in electoral votes was a comfortable 214 to 155. Disappointed and A disappointed and deranged office seeker named Charles Guteau shot President Garfield at Washington Railroad Station soon after he was elected. Garfield lingered in agony for 11 weeks, and he died on September 19, 1881. Guteau was found guilty of murder and hanged. Garfield's murder had one positive outcome. It shocked politicians into reforming the shameful spoil system, and it became an unlikely instrument of reform uh, in the new president, who was to be Chester Arthur. The Pendleton Act of 1883 was passed, which became the Magna Carta of civil service reform. It made compulsory campaign contributions from federal employees illegal. It established the Civil Service Commission to make appointments to federal jobs on the basis of competitive examinations rather than having pull. At first, covering only 10% of federal jobs, Civil service did rein in most, the most blatant abuses. Plum federal posts were now beyond reach, so politicians were forced to look elsewhere for money, which was the mother's milk of politics. They were increasingly turned to big corporations for money, and a new breed of boss will emerge. The Pendleton Act partially divorced politics from patronage and helped drive politicians into marriages of convenience with big business. President Arthur's display of integrity offended too many powerful Republicans. His party turned him out to pasture, and in 1886, he died of a cerebral hemorrhage. This is a political cartoon, The Balloon in Distress, Throwing Out Ballast, 1882, showing President Arthur, who had surprised many by showing that he was a reformer in office, and the cartoon depicts him chucking Republican cronies overboard, to help unsnag the GOP balloon from the tree of public indignation. James G. Blaine was persistent in seeking the Republican nomination, and it paid off in 1884. He became the clear choice of the convention in Chicago. Some reformers, unable to swallow Blaine, bolted to the Democrats, and they were called mugwumps. The Democrats turned to reformer Grover Cleveland. He was the mayor of Buffalo to the governor of New York and to a presidential nomination only in three years. Cleveland's admirers soon got shocked. They learned he had an illegitimate son and, they, and that he had actually made financial provisions for that son. The campaign of 1884 sank to perhaps the lowest level in American experience. People targeted personalities, not principles, and these were mostly the headlines in the run-up to the election. The contest hinged on the state of New York, where Blaine would blundered badly in the closing days of the campaign. The Republican clergy called the Democrat part, Democratic Party rum, Romanism, and rebellion, insulting culture, faith, and patriotism of New York's Irish-American voters. Blaine refused to repudiate the phrase, and the New York Irish vote gave the presidency to Cleveland as a result. Cleveland swept the solid South and squeaked into office 219 electoral votes to 182 electoral votes. This is a political cartoon called I Want My Pa, which was a very malicious anti-Cleveland cartoon. Cleveland, in 1885, was the first Democrat to take the oath of the presidency since Buchanan 28 years earlier. Cleveland was a man of principles. He was a staunch apostle of hands-off creed of laissez-faire. He summed up the philosophy in 1887 when he vetoed the bill to provide seed for drought-ravaged Texas farmers. Though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. And that was a Clevelandism. 
He was outspoken, unbending, and hot-tempered. He narrowed the north-south chasm by naming two former Confederates to the cabinet, and Cleveland whipsawed between the demands of Democratic faithfully who want the job, who wanted jobs, mugwumps who had helped elect him, who wanted reform. And at first he favored reform, but eventually caved to the carpings of the Democratic bosses. He fired almost two thirds of 120,000 federal employees, including 40,000 incumbent, incumbent Republican postmasters, to make room for more deserving Democrats. Military pensions gave Cleveland political headaches. The powerful Grand Army of the Republic lobbied for hundreds of pension bills that granted benefits to deserters, bounty jumpers, men who never served, and former soldiers who incurred disabilities not connected to the war. The conscience-driven president read each bill carefully. He vetoed several hundred, hundred and laboriously penned in individual veto messages to Congress. The tariff is the next issue, and Cleveland is going to battle for a lower tariff. The, he was increased initially to raise revenues for the Civil War military. The Republicans profited from the high protection, and it piled up revenue at customs houses. But by 1881, the Treasury had an annual surplus of $145 million. Most, government, most of the government income, pre-income tax, came from this tariff. The surplus could be reduced. Rather than squander it on pensions and pork barrel bills, it was to use to curry favor with veterans and self-seekers. The lower tariff, big industrialists vehemently opposed. Cleveland knew little and cared less about the tariff before entering the White House. As he studied the tariff, he favored the downward revision of the tariff schedules. This would mean lower prices for consumers and less protection for monopolies. It would mean an end to the Treasury surplus. Cleveland saw his duty and overdid it. He made an appeal to Congress in late 1887, which frustrated the Democrats, but the Republicans rejoiced at his apparent recklessness. He claimed the lower tariffs would mean higher taxes, lower wages, and increased unemployment. For the first time in years, a real issue divided the two parties. This is a picture titled Battling Over Lowering the Tariff in the 1880s. You can pause and read the explanation. In the upcoming 1888 presidential election, Democrats dejectedly renominated Cleveland in the St. Louis Convention. The Republicans turned to Benjamin Harrison, who was the grandson of former President William Henry Harrison. The two parties flooded the country with 10 million pamphlets on the tariff. The Republicans raised 3 million, the heftiest yet, largely by frying the fat of nervous industrialists. This is a picture titled Weighing the Candidates and novelties like this were widely distributed in the late 19th century political campaigns. The money was used to line up corrupt voting cattle known as repeaters or floaters. In Indiana, a crucial swing state, voters purchased were purchased for as much as $20 each. So on election day, Harrison nosed out Cleveland 233 to 168 electoral votes. The change of 7,000 New York ballots would have reversed the income outcome. Cleveland polled more popular votes and became the first sitting president defeated since Martin Van Buren in 1840. So now there was a Republican in office. He had only three more votes than necessary in the House for a quorum. The Democrats obstructed House business by refusing to answer roll calls. They demanded roll calls to determine the presence of the quorum, and they employed other delaying tactics as well. The new Republican Speaker of the House was Thomas B. Reed of Maine. Reed bent the House to his imperious will. He counted as present Democrats who had not answered the roll and who, rule book in hand, denied they were legally there. By such tactics, Czar Reed dominated billion-dollar Congress. It was the first to appropriate that sum. They showered pensions on the Civil War veterans, increased the government purchases of silver, and passed the McKinley Tariff Act of 1890, which boosted rates to the highest peacetime level, an average of 48.4% on dutiable goods. Thomas B. Reed of Maine, the Republican Speaker of the House, 1890, is in this picture. The results of the McKinley Tariff Act of 1890 
debt-burdened farmers had no choice but to buy manufactured goods from high-priced protected industrialists. They were compelled to sell their agricultural products in highly competitive, unprotected world markets. Mounting discontent against, tariff, against this tariff caused many rural voter, voters to rise in anger. In con the congressional election of 1890, Republicans lost the majority, and the seats were reduced to 88 as opposed to 235 Democrats. Even McKinley was defeated. The new Congress included nine from the Farmers Alliance, which was a militant organization of Southern and Western farmers. The People's Party, or the Populists, are going to rise during this time period, and they were rooted in the Farmers' Alliance, which met in Omaha in 1892. Their platform denounced the prolific womb of government injustice. They demanded inflation through free and unlimited coinage of silver, 16 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. They called for a graduated income tax, government ownership of railroads and the telegraph, and direct election of U.S. senators with a one-term limit on the presidency, adoption of initiative and referendums to allow citizens to shape legislation directly. This is a picture of a Minnesota farmer leading a Husker shredder in the 1890s. This technologically advanced farm equipment increased the productivity of farmers, but also saddled them with debt. They also wanted a shorter workday and immigration restrictions. Populists uproaringly nominated the greenbacker, General James Weaver. Then the homestead strike of 1892 took place. At Andrew Carnegie's homestead steel plant near Pittsburgh, officials called in 300 armed Pinkerton detectives to crush the strike by the steel workers over pay cuts. The strikers for forced Pinkerton assailants to surrender after a vicious battle that left 10 dead and 60 wounded. After the troops entered, the Union was broken. This is a picture of the homestead strike in 1892. The populists had a remarkable showing in the presidential election, which we'll see on the map on 23.3. They achieved 1,029,846 popular votes and 22 electoral votes for Weaver, which is one of the few third parties ever to win electoral votes. They fell far short of the electoral majority, but the populist votes came from only six Midwestern and Western states. Only four, Kansas, Colorado, Ohio, and Nevada, fell completely into the populist basket. This is a map of the presidential election of 1892 showing the vote by county. This is a picture of the Kansas legislature in 1893, where rifle-bearing populists seized the Kansas capital after the election of 1892. The South was unwilling to support a new party. One million black farmers organized the Colored Farmers National Alliance, which shared many of the same complaints with the poor white farmers, and the populist leaders reached out to the black community and stressed the common economic problems that they had, but the black leaders were disillusioned with the Republican Party, and they responded to the, to the um, populist party. Alarmed, the white elite in the South played upon racial antagonisms to counter the populist appeal and to woo the poor whites back to the Democratic Party. The Southern blacks were heavy losers. The white Southerners used literacy tests and poll taxes to deny the blacks the vote. The grandfather clause exempted from the new requirements anyone whose forebearer voted in 1860. So when the black slaves had not voted at all, more than a century would pass before Southern blacks could again vote in considerable numbers. Jim Crow laws spread through the South as well and imposed racial segregation in public places, including hotels and restaurants, and they were enforced by lynchings and other forms of intimidation. The crusade to eliminate the black vote had dire consequences for the Populist Party. Tom Watson abandoned the interracial appeal and became a racist. The Populist Party lapsed into vile racism and advocated black disenfranchisement. Cleveland will again be elected to office in 1893, the only president ever re-elected after a defeat. He was the same Cleveland, but not the same country. Debtors were up in arms, the workers were restless, and the devastating depression of 1893 had burst lasting four years and punishing 
Um, and this was the most punishing economic downturn of the 19th century. The economic depression of 1893 causes the splurge of overbuilding and speculation, or was caused by the splurge of overbuilding and speculation. It was caused by labor disorders, which were ongoing, and an agricultural depression that was ongoing, caused by free silver agitation, which damaged the American credit abroad, and U.S. finances were pinched when European banks began to call in loans. The depression ran deep and far. 8,000 businesses collapsed within six months, and dozens of railroad lines went into receivers' hands. Soup kitchens fed the unemployed. Gangs of hobos and tramps wandered the country. Local charities did their feeble best, but the U.S. government, bound by let nature take its course philosophy, saw no legitimate way to relieve the suffering. Cleveland, who had now earlier been bothered by a surplus, was now burdened with the deepening deficit. The Treasury required to, him to issue legal tender notes for silver bullion that it bought. The owners of the paper currency would present it for gold. By law, the notes had to be reissued. New holders would repeat the process, and it drained the gold in an endless chain of operation. The gold reserve in the Treasury dropped below $100 million. Cleveland sought the repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890, but to do so, he summoned Congress into a special session. Cleveland developed a malignant growth in his mouth, which was removed with extreme secrecy. If he had died, the vice president, Adelaide Stevenson, who was a soft money person, would have been president, which would have deepened the crisis. In Congress, the debate over the repeal of the Silver Act ran its heated course. William Jennings Bryan championed free silver. Friends of Silver announced that hell would freeze over before Congress would pass the repeal. Cleveland broke the filibuster and doing so alienated the Democratic silver rights like Bryan and disrupted his party at the start of his term. The repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act only partially stopped the drain of gold from the Treasury. In February 1894, the gold reserve sank to $41 million. The United States was in danger of going off the gold standard. Cleveland floated, floated two Treasury bond issues in 1894, totaling over $100 million. The endless chain operations continued, and in early 1895, Cleveland turned in desperation to J.P. Morgan, the banker's banker, and the head of a Wall Street syndicate. After tense negotiations at the White House, the bankers agreed to lend the government $65 million in gold, and they charged commission of $7 million. It did make a significant success, uh, they did make a significant concession when the bankers agreed to obtain one half of gold abroad. The loan, at least temporarily, helped restore confidence in the nation's finances. The gold deal stirred up the nation and symbolized all that was wicked in politics. Cleveland's secretive dealings with Morgan were savagely condemned as a sellout of the national government. Cleveland was certain he had done no wrong, but Cleveland suffered further embarrassment with the Wilson-Gorman tariff in 1894. In this tariff, the Democrats pledged to lower the tariff, but the bill that made it through Congress was loaded with special interest protection. Outraged, Cleveland allowed the bill to become law without his signature. It contained a 2% tax on incomes over $4,000. When the Supreme Court struck down the income tax provision in 1894, populists and disaffected saw the proof that the courts were the tools of the plutocrats. The Democrats' political fortunes suffered severe setbacks. The House Democrats were dislodged in, 18, uh, in 1894, where the Republicans won congressional election in a landslide, 244 seats to 105 for Democrats. Republicans looked forward to the presidential race of 1896. Cleveland failed to cope with the economic crisis of 1893 and became one of the forget forgettable presidents, along with Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, and Harrison. And this is the chronology from the chapter.